Hello and welcome to Ogden by Sea Church's Reading the Bible Together. My name is Dom, I'm the pastor of the church, and it's great that you can join me as we continue reading through the book of Deuteronomy, which is the book that we're reading through in September 2023. We've reached chapter 18. Uh, it's quite a long book and we're doing various reading sessions, but it's great and I pray this is a blessing to you today. I don't know how you're doing, hope you're doing all right, and we ought to pray before we dive in. So please would you pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God who is love, that you are eternally love, because you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit have always known love between yourself and you created to share this love with us. And Father, we thank you that in Christ we are brought into this love of yours. And we pray that your love would be made known to us afresh, that we would see something new of it, and that not only learn of it, but that we would experience it in our lives through your Holy Spirit. So Lord, with everything that's going on in our lives now, we come to you and we pray that you'd speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this is Moses speaking to the second generation coming out of Egypt. It's interesting to think, isn't it, that they did see the signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, probably most of them. Uh, but not as they were adults, but when they were younger. And because it was this specific generation of the army, the fighting men of Israel, that died in the wilderness. The ones who were meant to go into the promised land, but they failed to believe that the Lord would do it for them. Uh, so all those faithless people, they died in the wilderness. And then it was their children who were probably... Uh, in Egypt, they knew something of Egypt, but they weren't the ones to fight. It's the children. It's to the children that belong the, ch the kingdom of God. Isn't it interesting? Anyway, right, so this is Moses speaking to that generation before they go in to the promised land and the Lord will give it to them. And we're just left off in chapter 17 in our previous reading section about the king. So, so much of the unfolding story of the Bible has its roots in Deuteronomy and about the whole kingship where you get Saul and David and then the other kings, it harks back to Deuteronomy. And now in chapter 18, we're going to hear about the priests and we're going to also hear about the prophets. So these anointed ones, these Christs in the Old Testament, these ones who are anointed with the oil to show that they are equipped and set apart by the Holy Spirit for specific uh, purposes. Um, yeah, and they all picture the Christ, the Lord Jesus, who is the king, who is the priest, the high priest, and who is the prophet. Anyway, let's dive in. Verse 1 of chapter 18, the Levitical priests indeed, the whole tribe of Levi, are to have no allotment or inheritance with Israel. They shall live on the food offerings presented to the Lord, for that is their inheritance. They shall have no inheritance among their fellow Israelites. The Lord is their inheritance, as he promised them. I just think that is so beautiful. And as we're described as a kingdom of priests, I think there's a connotation along these lines in it, that we have no inheritance in here on earth. Our hope, our lot is the Lord. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. It had practical ramifications for them in the Old Testament context, obviously, because they didn't have their own land. And so they were in some ways, in many ways, dependent on the faithfulness of God's people. Verse 3, this is the share due the priests from the people who sacrifice a bull or a sheep, the shoulder, the internal organs and the meat from the head. I love ox cheek. I think it is probably one of the best cuts of meat going cooked properly. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, not so too fussed on the internal organs, though, I have to say. Verse four, you were to give them the first fruits of your grain, new wine and olive oil and the first wool from the shearing of your sheep. For the Lord your God has chosen them and their descendants out of all your tribes to stand and minister in the Lord's name always. If a Levite moves from one of your towns anywhere in Israel where he is living and comes in all earnestness to the place the Lord will choose, 
he may minister in the name of the Lord his God like all his fellow Levites who serve there in the presence of the Lord. He is to share equally in their benefits, even though he has received money from the sale of family possessions. There is this uh, ping pong match of generosity, of blessing, of gifts between the Lord and his people as the Levites. So uh, it goes back to the Passover where all of the firstborn were to be judged because of sin. The wage of sin is death and the Lord is going to go through the land of Egypt and the firstborn of each family would bear the punishment of that family and would die. However, in in Israel and all who trusted the promise of God and the provision of God, the Passover lamb, it, the firstborn was not only a substitute for the sin of the family, but the lamb of God would be the substitute for the firstborn of the family. And so the firstborn is redeemed. And But then all of the firstborn of Israel were belonging to the Lord. They consecrated the Lord. And in their stead, again, another substitute, the tr whole tribe of Levi was chosen to be uh, special, devoted to the Lord. So they're completely given over to the Lord. And you could ask, okay, what does that mean? Are they going to be killed like the Passover lamb? No, they are. The Lord has them and then the Lord gives them back in order to be ministers, to be mediators between God's people and the living God, the Lord. And then so the Lord gives the Levites to them and then the, then the people are to give to the Levites in order to provide for them. So that hopefully you can see that there's this big back and forth be between giving to the Lord and the Lord giving to his people. But of course, the Lord cannot be outdone in giving. <laughs> He's like the pro. And so, uh, yeah. Anyway, let's keep going. Verse 9. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. It's worrying that paganism, uh, witchcraft is becoming uh, more and more popular in Wales and the UK at the moment. We have forsaken uh, Jesus and the, the Christianity that provided the foundations of much of our society and our values today. And there is a, a turning to these things that claim to be good uh, because there are witches uh, and what do you call male witches? Is it wizards or is it shaman? I don't know. But uh, yeah, there is a label of white witchcraft or white magic. And yet we know in the Bible that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And his name Lucifer literally means light bearer. But it is a lie. And there are various powerful testimonies of people who have been uh, seduced by the claims and actually also the power within magic and witchcraft and want to use it for good. But they become captives to it. They're controlled by it, possessed by it. Stay away. These laws are for, were for the benefit of God's people. Don't play with fire. It's not because the fire is not real. It's because the fire is dangerous. And it's the same thing with this. The fire is dangerous. Stay away from it. Trust in the Lord. 
and it, it, I could go on and on about this, but it does remind me of Genesis 3, the original sin of humanity. The lie of Satan is God doesn't want you to have this because he knows that your eyes would be opened and you'll become like God. And witchcraft has the same lie ingrained in it, saying you can grasp this for yourself, this power, this wisdom for yourself, and you can become like God. That's the lie. But in fact, it dehumanizes you, let alone makes you anything like God. It is in Christ, who is the image of God, that we become, we reflect the living God in his beauty and character. Let's keep reading for now. Verse 14, the nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. Remember, this is Moses speaking. So he's saying that another prophet like himself will be raised up by the Lord. And uh, sometimes this is taken by Muslims to mean, see, this is a, a prophecy about Muhammad, but it can't be about Muhammad. Uh, one, he was nothing like Moses. And second, he was not from the tribes of Israel. This is speaking about Jesus. <laughs> uh, this is he is from the line of Judah and he is. Yeah, he is like Moses in many, many ways. Uh, you must listen to him. And what the, did God the Father speak at uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration? This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And I think there's similar words at Jesus' baptism. Listen to him. Verse 16. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. So this one prophet will come, is promised, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it all hangs on him, doesn't it? So I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words, that the prophet speaks in my name. So your eternal destiny is bound up with whether you listen to this prophet or whether you reject his words. And then Jesus comes and says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He's described as the word of God, who is God. So it's all about Jesus. And the biggest question in life is actually what you're going to do with Jesus. Who is he to you? Are you going to listen to him? And it's all or nothing as well when it comes to faithfulness. There are other prophets who come and they speak in the name of other gods. And because of the danger, because of the eternal danger that that puts people in, they are to be put to death. That's the context that it's in. And also, um, again, hopefully you can see that this pattern plays out a number of times, but the ultimate fulfillment is Jesus. And that is clear by this passage, verses 17. Well, before that, uh, 15 to 19. It's clear that this is only ultimately true of Jesus. And yet there are glimpses of this fulfillment because you get Samuel. Uh, you get the judges, but then you get Samuel. And then you get like Isaiah and then Ezekiel. Well, Eli yeah, Elijah and Elisha are big ones as well. But you get all these other prophets that come and they do faithfully 
pass on the message that the word of the Lord gives them. But there comes in the fullness of time where the word becomes flesh. Long ago, in many ways, uh, various times the Lord spoke through the prophets. and you know, But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. It's Jesus. Okay. Verse 21. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alarmed. There are loads of people who gather a following get people very loyal to them, and they make all these predictions, don't they? The thing is, do they come true? And do their followers still stick with them after the time when what they said is meant to have come true? Anyway, chapter 19. When the Lord your God has destroyed the nations whose land he is giving you, and when you have driven them out and settled in their towns and houses, then set aside for yourselves three cities in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Determine the distances involved and divide into three parts the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, so that a person who kills someone may flee for refuge to one of these cities. This is the rule concerning anyone who kills a person and flees there for safety. Anyone who kills a neighbour unintentionally without malice or forethought. For instance, a man may go into the forest with his neighbour to cut wood, and as he swings his axe to fell a tree, the head may fly off and hit his neighbour and kill him. That man may flee to one of these cities and, and save his life. Otherwise, the avenger of blood might pursue him in a rage, overtake him if the distance is too great, and kill him even though he is not deserving of death since he did it to his neighbour without malice or forethought. This is why I command you to set aside for yourselves three cities. Some of the language here gets to the heart of the rescue of Jesus and the safety that he provides through shedding his blood on the cross for us. Because there's words like unintentionally, and in the Bible, there are two kinds of sins. There's unintentional sin and there's intentional sin. There is sinning with a high hand and then there's uh, unintentional sin. And uh, the fact that there is a refuge for those who sin in this way unintentionally shows that uh, as we confess our sin and all of our sin, the sin that we've done with a high hand as well as unintentional because sin is sin whether we realize it or not and whatever our motivation is the lord is judged the lord knows and um but that as we confess our sin there is an advocate like jesus has paid for our sin on the cross and so the way is there and he is our refuge we are covered if you think about it in the imagery of passover sheltering under the blood of the lamb that's the kind of refuge that Jesus provides. So these words of refuge and even city, that kind of idea, is picturing the Lord Jesus for us. Um, and it also kind of delves into the depths of uh, the nature of sin. Anyway, I say anyway a lot to end up these things <laughs> because... There's loads more, I'm sure you realise I, I could be saying. Hopefully I'm just giving you helpful pointers. Verse 8. If the Lord your God in Lord enlarges your territory as he promised on oath to your ancestors and gives you the whole land that he promised them, because you carefully follow all these laws I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to walk always in obedience to him, then you are to set aside three more cities. Do this so that innocent blood will not be shed in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you as your inheritance, and so that you will not be guilty of bloodshed. There is something deep within all of us 
which demands justice. But it's the living God who is just, but also the justifier. Look up Romans 3 if you want. Verse 11. But if out of hate someone lies in wait, assaults and kills a neighbour, and then flees to one of these cities, the killer shall be sent for by the town elders, be brought back from the city, and be handed over to the avenger of blood to die. Show no pity. You must purge from Israel the guilt of shedding innocent blood, so that it may go well with you. So this refuge... If, if someone who is an actual murderer, who out of selfishness has planned it out and has taken someone's life, someone made in the image of God, someone who is worth more than the whole world. If someone kills that person and then they try to cover it up and try to be safe, they go to one of these cities of refuge. There is no refuge for them. So think again about this idea of sinning with a high hand, sinning intentionally versus unintentional sin. If that person goes and they're trying to look for mercy, for safety, there's no place for them. And in fact, the, the leaders of that town will hand them in where they looked for safety. And if they deserve justice, then that is what they will get. Verse 14. And well, maybe I can't leave it there because what about us? And because we do all kinds of things. Well, Jesus says there's only one unforgivable sin. And that is not coming to him for forgiveness. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It's, it's rejecting Jesus. Everything else the Jesus has died on the cross for to atone, to cover so, uh, yeah, well, the message is here, flee to Jesus for refuge. Verse 14, do not move your neighbor's boundary stone set up by your predecessors in the inheritance you receive in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. That's an obvious one which ought to be covered with love your neighbor as yourself. And even love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength because the lord gave you your inheritance and he gave them their inheritance and so you shouldn't be messing around with boundary stones not digging out the fence and trying to get an extra bit of land but hard heart hard hearts lead to more legislation verse 15 one witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offence they may have committed. The matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. This comes up in the Gospel according to John, where they say in John chapter 8, and uh, maybe even 6, 7 and 8, is it 7, 8 and 9, possibly. It's that big, long discourse. But uh, yeah, the Pharisees and the crowd, the Jewish crowd around Jesus, they say, you're claiming all this about yourself. And he says he's the light of the world, for instance. Jesus, you're just claiming this yourself. Who's going to back you up? And he says, look, the law says it needs to be established by two or three witnesses. And Jesus is a witness, and the Father is a witness, and actually in the in John's Gospel, um, the witness of the Father is also borne out by John the Baptist. And Jesus also points to the signs that he's doing as so showing that that is the Father's testimony about him. But ultimately, it's him rising from the dead. That is the witness that Jesus is who he says he is. But on a very basic kind of day-to-day -day level this is just necessary isn't it in the broken world that we live or else those in power will just be accusing anyone and everyone of any crime whereas this guards truth 
in some way. I wish it didn't have to be this way, but because of the way that the world is, it needs to be this way. And that's why our law courts need to be that way, based on evidence, based on witnesses, to find the truth. Verse 16, if a malicious witness takes the stand to accuse someone of a crime, the two people involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priest and the judge, judge who are in office at the time. The judges must make a thorough investigation and if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against a fellow Israelite, then do to the false witness as the witness intended to do to the other party. You can't say fairer than that. You must purge the evil from among you. The rest of the people will hear of this and be afraid, and never again will such an evil thing be done among you. Show no pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So this is like a, a summing up of the judicial law, and you need this law, this fairness, in order to understand the grace of God, which is at work in this Old Testament situation. And because like the whole book of Romans is kind of built on the the yeah, the righteousness by the law and the righteousness of, that comes through faith in Jesus, but both are based on Deuteronomy. So it's not this isn't like the new thing. The the being saved by grace through faith is not a New Testament idea. The apostles came with saying nothing new. All they've said is the Messiah has come. His name is Jesus. The way has always been faith in the Messiah. But anyway, here, this life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, is good. And it's good in that it stops retaliation escalating to silliness. Because that's what we know of, isn't it? That's where you get countries at war with each other for generations and generations and always, always escalating. Whereas this says, no, it's fair. So if you've poked someone else's eye out, one of your eyes is going to go. And you need that baseline of what is deserved in order to fully appreciate the glory of forgiveness. The glory of grace. You can't appreciate grace until you realise what is deserved. Because Jesus says, you know it is written, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. He says, bless those who persecute you. Love your enemies. Walk the extra mile, turn the other cheek. Okay, how are you doing? Are you still with me? Let's read one more chapter, if we can. When you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots in an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them. It's great, isn't it? Knowing that that situation will come up. He's like, I know, I know. It's in the diary. It's going to happen. But when it happens, don't be afraid of them because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt remember that when the Lord fought for you and rescued you and you did nothing and on the banks of the Red Sea and you did nothing and the Lord rescued you and judged your enemies who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you when you're about to go into battle the priest shall come forward and address the army he shall say hear Israel today you are going into battle against your enemies do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not panic or be terrified by them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. The officers shall say to the army, Has anyone built a new house and not yet begun to live in it? Let him go home, or he may die in battle and someone else may begin to live in it. Has anyone planted a vineyard? and not begun to enjoy it, let him go home, or he may die in battle and someone else enjoy it. Has anyone become pledged to a woman and not married her? Let him go home, or he may die in battle and someone else may marry her. Then the officers shall add, 
Is anyone afraid or faint-hearted? Let him go home so that his fellow soldiers will not become disheartened too. When the officers have finished speaking to the army, they shall appoint commanders over it. I think of Gideon and the 300 that got whittled down from however many before. I mean, it wasn't loads to begin with, but it got whittled down and whittled down. And the point is, the power is not in themselves. It's the Lord. And so they can say, look, we don't need you. So if you can't be here, if you don't want to be here, go. But if, if you're going to be here and you're going to see God do something amazing today, then stay and fight and see that the Lord fights for you. So there's Gideon, but it also reminds me of Jesus when he says about counting the cost of following him. Because it gets to the heart, doesn't it? And it's an image that isn't really mentioned so much today because of the... There's like an uneasiness about religion and warfare and all that. And like Christianity today, like there is just war. I'm not saying that there isn't. But we don't take matters into our own hands as Christians, as followers of Jesus. He has given our marching orders as his people. And he, and he, sa he says to Peter, who sliced off the high priest servant's ear, is it Rufus? Um... This is not my way. And then he goes and dies. That is his way. Um, yeah, so, but this language of counting the cost. It's also reminiscent of that parable that Jesus says about the invitations to the banquet, isn't it? They turn it down. They say, oh, I've just bought some cattle and I need to go see to them. Or I just got married or whatever. They make excuses. It's interesting, isn't it? But anyway, um, what I'm saying about the military language is it is biblical to think and to believe and to think through how we are enlisted in the army of the Lord of hosts. But it's not physical warfare. Uh, yeah, Ephesians 6 has much to say about it, and the Apostle Paul elsewhere. Anyway, there we go. <laughs> We've all got these verbal tics, and uh, reading through this, um, I realise that I say anyway a lot, don't I? Anyway, verse 10. When you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labour and shall work for you. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put to the sword all the men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves. And you may use the plunder the Lord, gives, the Lord your God gives you from your enemies. This is how you are to treat all the cities that are at a distance from you and do not belong to the nations nearby. Now, I've got to be honest, that language makes me feel uneasy and it probably makes you feel a bit squeamish. This idea of taking women and children in the same category as livestock and as plunder, that doesn't sit right with me. Who am I? To judge? Yeah, I need to do a bit more chewing over that, to be honest. It's hard, isn't it? Verse 16. However, in the cities of the nations the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshipping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. In some ways that's easier to come to terms with, because we've heard about what these 
uh, nations within Cana are like, and we've been warned about what will happen if they remain and if they mix with them. So in some ways, it's, it's e and also to, to see that the reality of this wasn't their total annihilation. And that there are, there were key examples of mercy. And yet, yeah, anyway, <laughs> anyway, verse 19. When you lay siege to a city for a long time, fighting against it to capture it, do not destroy its trees by putting an axe to them because you can eat their fruit. Do not cut them down. Are the trees people that you should besiege them? I'm going to click on that footnote, which says, or oh, down to use in the siege, cut down to use in the siege for the fruit trees are for the benefit of the people. However, you may cut down trees that you know are not fruit trees and use them to build siege works until the city at war with you falls. So is this just saying what's savvy? It's like don't bite the hand that feeds you, that kind of thing. So you might think that you're going to uh, cut these trees down in order to conquer this place, but actually you're destroying yourself because you need the food that these trees will provide. So is it being something savvy? Is it talking about like God's care for nature? Um, like this phrase, which does have the footnote in it, so it's probably disputable, but it says, are the trees people that you should besiege it? them and maybe that does strike a chord with our culture today who are sensitive to ecological matters are we at war with creation maybe it seems like in many ways we are we shouldn't be and it's collateral damage as we fight with each other Anyway, my favourite word, God bless, thanks for joining me and I'll see you again soon.